So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, demonstration and QA session. Uh, let me have the opportunity to give a small introduction regarding uh, Supriya Ma'am. Uh, Dr. Supriya Seshadri Ma'am, uh, she completed her uh, obstetrics and gynecology degree from the JNMC Belagam and her uh, fellowship in peto maternal medicine from the Rajiv Gandhi Universe. She is also one of the leading experts in the ultrasound domain with an experience of over 19 years. And uh, she is also a trainer in the OBG ultrasound. And uh, today we'll be having a small demonstration session uh, with a small overview of the gynae imaging. And uh, ma'am will also be taking any questions uh, or doubts you have regarding these. Uh, over to you, ma'am. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Yogesh, for that introduction and uh, welcome all of you on a Saturday evening. Now, what I intend to do is to give you a flair of gynae ultrasound because it goes without saying that every, every uh, you know, it's like the ultrasound is like the third finger, let's put it that way. And every decision, whether it's fetal or gynae, is always based on ultrasound, be it for diagnosis or management. So I'm just going to take you through a demo of what we normally see. I'll start with the normals. For that, I think you will have to, let me share my screen. Okay, so can you see my screen? Yes, ma'am. We are able to see your screen, yes. Okay, I'm presuming that uh, all the joinees are gynecologists or, I mean, in a sense, uh, studying gynecology or finished gynecology, or are they of any other speciality? Okay, never mind. So uh, in gynae, when we evaluate the pelvis, so to speak, there are two ways of evaluating. One is the transabdominal and transvaginal. Now, as you can see, even if you didn't know scans, because this is a bladder, so obviously this is a transabdominal scan. And the structure that I see here is the uterus. Now, how do I know it's the uterus? Is, it is pear-shaped, like how it's in anatomy. And when I scan, there are certain, a lot of rules, in fact, which have to be followed with scanning in order to get our anterior posterior right and left correct. And uh, all that I'm going to be demoing here is all in the ultrasound program of the OBSGYN residency. And uh, it's, it's covered much more detail there. So I will not go into the nuances about the rules and regulations, but this is the uterus. Now, once I see the uterus, because this is actually a single plane, like, like it's a 2D. So it's the, the, any, any structure in the body is a three-dimensional structure, but on 2D ultrasound, that is two-dimensional ultrasound, it just gives us a plane. So studying a plane is not enough. I need to see the whole structure. I can see the whole structure by doing a 3D scan, but the 3D scan techniques and skills come only after we get a proper hang of the 2D. So this is the uterus. Now, what do I do? I am just moving the probe so that I am seeing the entire uterus side to side. So how, do, uh, as I said, I recognize uterus because it is a pear-shaped organ. Now, in this is what I call a sagittal um, plane of the uterus. Now, all of you are familiar because even in our medical days, we learned that this is sagittal suture. So which means this suture runs this way and divides the body into a right and a left. Then there is a coronal suture running down, which divides the body into a front and a back. And there is an axial suture, which runs sideways, which divides the body into an upper part and a lower part. So when in the sagittal plane, what I'm able to see is I can see the fundus. I can see the upper corpus, mid corpus, lower corpus, and cervix. So when I sweep, I know that this is a normal uterus. And if I have to see the ovaries, then I can I, I, I can see the ovary. Like when I sweep, I can see one ovary here, and I can see another ovary here as well. But ovary calls for laterality or side. In the sense, I have to say which is the right side, which is the left side. Just because I move the probe to a particular side doesn't make the, you know, make the, the ovary of that side. So as I said, axial will cut this way. So only when I cut this way, I know that I have a, a left side and a right side. So for that, I have to actually use, you, you know, do a transverse sweep. And then when I do the transverse sweep, as you can see that this is your, uh, this is the left ovary because how do I know that uh, left, as I said, one of the first rule that we follow or we kind of train ourselves in ultrasound is where is the screen marker? Now this screen marker is always on the right side of the patient. So if this screen marker is on the right side of the patient, and if this is a display screen, this is a display monitor, this is what we call a sector. So when the display monitor is divided into two halves, there is one half on the side of the screen marker, 
and which will make it the right side and the other half on the left side of the screen or the other side of the screen marker which will make it the left side so that's why this is the left ovary so this is a very very uh, you know brief overview of normal now i'll take you through another volume uh, please feel free to uh, you know ask in the chat box or even voice out your questions because i am more you know concentrated on doing the scans i'm not really reading your questions but one of you could actually uh, tell me either dr yogesh or vaishnav you could tell me now this is a dedicated uh, volume of the ovary this is again transabdominal now how do i recognize the ovary you know by anatomy that the ovary is an elongated structure or a novel structure with anechoic spaces within which are the follicles okay let me just do some optimizations because in order to get good image it's all about image optimization and uh, we really don't have time to go into the various fact features for image optimization but i will just i think you can see my screen so what am i doing i am actually you know enlarging the image and as the image as enlarging the image becoming a little blurred so I will just decrease the brightness and increase the contrast. Now I see the ovary. So the ovary is an elongated structure with anechoic spaces, which are the follicles, and what we call a hyperechoic. Again, an ultrasound term, a hyperechoic stroma. So when I see the ovary, again, I have to sweep the ovary. So I am moving my probe so that I'm going from margin to margin of the ovary. And then I will go another plane and look, study the ovary that, you know, that way as well. Now, this, uh, these two volumes basic, basically cover transabdominal. So let me show you some normals on transvaginal because the gold standard for scanning is actually transvaginal scan in any lady in whom pelvic examination is possible. So in only in those in whom pelvic examination is not possible do we do a trans abdominal scan only. So let me take you through some, uh, you know, normal trans uh, vaginal scans and then probably I'll pause for a while and uh, I, I'm happy to take any questions from you. See, all that I'm showing you, in fact, all that I'm displaying is, again, part of the curriculum of gynae ultrasound uh, in the OpsGyne residency program. And uh, as I said, I'm just giving you a flair. I'm just giving you a taste of it. But there's much more of this will be covered in detail there because I think that whatever whatever skill skill level or whatever uh, you know education level, you may be a postgraduate, you may be a fresh uh, post, you may you may be a fresh MD, or you may be into several few years or even several years. It's important that we know to do the scans. And if you don't do the scans, it's important we know how to interpret the scan. So as I always say, it's not, it's not a good idea just to look at the impression. One must always look into the text or the body of the report. And that contains a lot of ultrasound uh, words and ultrasound language. So in order to interpret that, and also one must look at images, because images say a lot, images really speak a lot. So in order to interpret the text and in order to you know, interpret the ultrasound images, it's extremely important to be familiar with gynae, gyne for that matter, fetal ultrasound as well. So learning scanning is just not that I have to do it, but I also am learning it. I mean, I would say that one has to learn scans to know how to interpret the reports because all management, all decisions are based on ultrasound. So this is a transvaginal uh, scan. I would say transvaginal because of what this is the footprint. So the footprint in a transvaginal is just very narrow and a transabdominal is broad. Now, this is the bladder. And the first thing that we look in a, you know, when, when I see the uterus, I have to see the position. So this is an antiverted uterus. Here again, this is a sagittal plane of the uterus. Let me kind of just uh, make this image a little better. Yeah, I think you can see it nicely now. So this is the uterus. Again, I'm in a single plane, so I have to see the entire uterus. So what do I do? This is what is called sweeping. Now sweeping, I mean, the area of ultrasound is like a fan, like an inverted fan. So when we sweep, just imagine you have your fan in the hand. And if this is my probe, I can only fan this way. So when my probe is longitudinal or sagittal, I do a side-to-side -side sweep. And because I do a side-to-side -side sweep, this is a de dedicated study only of the uterus. So I'm able to see the uterus in its entirety. Now, if if I want to study, if I want to study the uterus, there are two things that I need to study. I need to take the measurement of the uterus. Now, this is position. What, the first position okay, is this, if it is, is correct. Um, position is if it is correct. Position if it is just, correct. Press the this space. This is what is called the uterus cervical length, and position this is the, the anterior if it is correct. diameter. 
So once I've taken the, this, then I will also have to take the transverse diameter. Now, very importantly, I'm sure, uh, you know, whatever levels of practice you are, you will be seeing ultrasound images. You will be seeing a lot of ultrasound, uh, or you'll be doing it yourself. Now, when I take my probe transverse, and then what do I do? Again, I have to sweep the entire uterus. So I'm going down. This is a cervix. And the minute the cervix becomes into like, uh, okay, uh, this is a triple layer pattern, but the pattern should always be studied in a sagittal plane, not the transverse plane. This is made to indicate mainly which is the level of the internal loss. So this will be the internal loss. Now, as I go up, I will go, my study should be, you know, should uh, involve the entire uterus. So I will move in such a way that, do you see this white line here? This is the visceral peritoneum. And this is where the fundal serosa is. So I sweep again, because this is my fan. Now I made my probe transverse. I can't move my fan this way. I have to move my fan up and down. So with an up and down sweep, I'm coming from the cervix, going to the uh, uh, endometrium, and then to the uterine fundus. And it is here that I will take a transverse diameter of the, of the uterus. Now, after having finished measurements, I will study the morphology of the uterus. The morphology of the uterus, again, is studied either from inside out or out in. Let me start out in. So this white is the serosa. So the serosa is regular or smooth. This is a myometrium. I would call this myometrium homogeneous. Again, there are rules as to why we call it homogeneous, and this is the endometrium. Now, when it comes to the endometrium, again, I have to take its measurement, and I have to study its pattern as well. So I'll optimize the endometrium. Now, how do I know that this is a correct planus? I always have to get the endometrium in continuity with the cervical canal, and this, this is what it is. This is cervical canal. So I've got the endometrium alone because I don't need to see, I'm not studying anything else right now. I'm only studying the endometrium, and then I will optimize it probably I will increase the brightness increase the contrast and then there, there I have a nice endometrium so how will I measure again I'm not putting the uh, you know measurement on because the inbuilt voice comes I will measure the endometrium widest perpendicular to the endometrial midline from the outer aspect of the basal layer to the outer aspect of the basal layer on this side so that completes my thickness next study the morphology of the endometrium Endometrium is studied in terms of pattern, and this is what I'll call a triple line, because there are three, what we call, I mean, to put it in layman's terms, bright, but in ultrasound, it means hyperequic. When I say hyperequic, I'm, uh, I'm comparing it with the surrounding myometrium, and this is brighter than the surrounding myometrium, and that's why I'm saying it's hyperequic. So I see three hyperequic lines. Now, this is the basal endometrium, basal endometrium, and this is the endometrial midline. And in between these three hyperequic lines, I see hypoequic. When I say hypoequic, this area is less bright compared to the myometrium. So when I see this kind of appearance, I know it is a triple line. After, uh, uh, you know, after noting the pattern, it's important for me also to note the endometrial midline. Is the midline continuous? Here it is. But if the midline is interrupted, then it can be due to a polyp, it can be due to a fibroid polyp, or it can even be to an RPOC against the background of pregnancy. And last but not the least, I should always look at the endomyometal junction. The endomyometal junction is the halo surrounding the endometrium. So the study of or the assessment of endometrium is not complete till you have noted all these features. So I think I'll pause for now and uh, Dr. Yogesh or uh, Vaishnav, is there any questions there or anybody wants to ask me aloud? Uh, yes. So far, no questions regarding uh, imaging one. Uh, okay. We allow the participants to talk. Uh, everyone... Okay, Dr. Prashant, you know what? I'm only doing guy here. I'm demoing gynae ultrasound. So I think this you can kind of put it to, mar to Maru and they will pass it on to the doctor, uh, to Dr. Vivek, who's actually handling the fetal medicine. Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay, so uh, I mean, I'd like a little interaction because I don't know if you followed normal. If you follow this, then I will take you through abnormal. So let's look at some abnormals of the uh, of the uterus. And for that, let's pick on. Okay, let's look at adenomyosis. 
Now, you know what is adenomyosis? Adenomyosis is endometrium in an ectopic junction, that is in an ectopic location. So the endometrium is actually in the myometrium. So because the endometrium is in the myometrium, it also undergoes these changes during the menstrual cycle. And because of that, it sets off certain, uh, it's, it sets off certain changes in the myometrium and these are the changes. So in an adenomyotic uterus, now if you recall the uterus I just showed you earlier, even if you didn't know it was adenomyosis, but you can definitely say that this uterus doesn't look normal when compared to what I have just demoed. So why is this not normal? For one, it is you know kind of rounded. Normal uterus will be pear-shaped. So this is like a globe, and this is what is called the globular appearance of the uterus. Then if you can see the the endometrium is really not well seen because that is a hallmark feature of adenomyosis since all the, is, uh, since all the pathophysiology starts there. So the endomyometal junction is not well seen. And then as I'm doing this sweep, can you see these fine lines, fine shadows? These are called fine striations. And if you uh, recall that normal image, in, in that uterus, I never saw these multiple, you know, whitish. I'm say, telling you white because this is an intro, uh, say an intro talk, but in ultrasound language, it's called hyperequic. I've never seen these hyperequic areas in the normal uterus. So these hyperequic areas, endometrial islands, this is what we call fine striations. It's a globular uterus. And also you can see that the endometrium is not in the midline. It seems more shifted to the anterior wall and there's a lot of posterior wall. It is, so this is called asymmetry of the myometrium because of the adeno, uh, because of certain changes. And all these fit into the pattern of adenomyosis. Now, always, I mean, even if you're not doing scans, I'm sure you've come across this conversation. Is it an adenomyosis or is it a fibroid? This dilemma is always there. I mean, however skilled one is, we do get challenges at times. So let's see how a fibroid looks. Now, again, this is a uterus. Now you're able to recognize this is definitely the uterus. And let me kind of optimize. Yeah. So here we see it's a thin endometrium, no doubt. The endometrium is very well defined. The EMJ is also well seen, but posteriorly, now this is the anterior wall, uh, posterior wall. Yes, there's an asymmetry of the myometrium uh, my uh, here because the endometrium seems uh, pushed more anteriorly than posteriorly. But what do we see here? We see a fairly well circumscribed lesion showing what we call dense shadows. Now, if you compare the shadows, what we saw in adenomyosis, they are very fine shadows. Now, these are called dense or stripy shadows. So when, in fact, there's more, this is this one fibroid here and there's another fibroid here. So when we see a fairly well circumscribed lesion showing very dense shadows, this is go, this goes in favor of of a fibroid. Vascularity helps because fibroids most often have what we call peripheral vascularity, whereas adenomyosis more often have a translational vascularity. This is just a 2D volume, so I really can't display the vascularity for you, but I'm sure you appreciate the difference between fibroid, which is this volume, and the previous one, which is adenomyosis. So these are the two abnormal uh, scenarios of the uterus, which is quite common. I mean, very, very quite common. In fact, every scan clinic, you will see at least one or two of these. Now, let me show you something else. So, no, I don't seem to have it here. Okay, let me show you a polyp. Again, polyp, again, is a very common uh, ultrasound finding. In fact, quite often the ladies are asymptomatic and come for some other, scan, some other scan and then we find this polyp. Now, how do I recognize this polyp? Let me again optimize this uh, image for you. So this is the uterus. It's a little too bright. Let me decrease the brightness. So I wish, you know, we were interacting, then I would have asked you what is different because I told you in a normal endometrium what all we look for. So uh, let me quickly take you through this. If I were to measure the endometrial thickness because a polyp is endometrial in origin, I will go across the polyp and measure the thickness here. But what is the abnormality that strikes us that this midline is interrupted. This midline is, 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 not, is not in continuity from, you know, from the lower part, like this is the internal loss. Now, why do I recognize the internal loss? Because 
very often we see these anechoic spaces and these anechoic spaces are the nepotensis. So you can see that this nepotensis ends here. This is the uterovesical fold and this is in line with the internal loss. So from the internal loss, when I trace, trace the midline, I can I see that the midline is, you know, stops somewhere here and again continues here. Now let me do a transverse scan as well. In a transverse, what do I see? I see a white line. So this is called the white line sign or the bright edge sign of a polyp because in the body, wherever two mucosal surfaces meet, they cast a white line. So this white line is coming from the polyp, which is mucosal and against the end of, and from the endometrium against which is, against which it is abutting. A definite, uh, you know, diagnostic feature will be, I don't have that right now with here on this volume, will be that when I put on color, I will get something called a feeder vessel. In the sense, I will see a single vessel going either from the anterior posterior wall into the polyp. So well-circumscribed hyporhythmic lesion in the, in the endometrium, which splits the midline, which has a white line sign, and which shows a feeder, a feeder vessel goes in favor of a polyp. So these are the three common uh, uterine pathologies that we come across. So any questions? There was another. Any questions? Okay. You're welcome, Prashant. Uh, participants, please feel free to ask any yeah, questions. Feel free. I mean, this is very informal and uh, uh, we, won't, we won't keep you long. Don't worry about that. It doesn't mean if you ask a question, I'm going to you know drag the time. No, we will just take a few volumes and uh... okay. Is there anything that specific? You can see the list here. I'm sure all of you all can see the list here. Is there anything specific you want me to demo, Doctor Yogesh? I think we'll leave a participant to kind of answer this or put in the chat box. All of you all can see the list here. I hope they are there. Yes, yes, ma'am. We do have some people. Uh, Dr. Rakshi, Amrita, Annapurna. No, no, I said I hope they're watching. I know they're there, but I hope they're yes. watching. Yes, okay, yes. in this list, would you like me to demo anything? Dr. Yogesh, since you know them, why don't you kind of just pick a name and ask them? Uh, Ma'am, I believe okay. there's a, a comment in the Q&A section. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's regarding hemorrhagic cyst and endometriotic cyst. Okay, how will you differentiate? Yes, that is again a, a very, very common dilemma, but there are, there are quite uh, definite features to uh, tell both. So now let me take you through endometriotic cyst. I'm only talking about the ultrasound appearance and here. Yeah. Now this is an endometriotic cyst and I say it's endometriotic because it has got what we call a ground glass appearance. And can you see these hyperequic spots? Now I'll use only ultrasound terms. So these are hyperequic spots within or in the wall. And these are due to the hemosiderin deposits. So the hallmark feature of an endometriotic cyst is it, is, it can be unilocular. When I say unilocular, it has got only one fluid containing space. So that's a locule, but it can have four to five locules as well. This is a unilocular mass with ground glass appearance showing hemosiderin deposits in the form of hyperequic foci. So this goes in favor of endometriosis. Now let me take you through hemorrhagic. Now hemorrhage, like you must be familiar, hemorrhage anywhere in the body goes through different stages. Initially, when the hemorrhage just happens, the blood on ultrasound is, is hyperequic. Then as the clot... Uh, uh, we have one comment saying, if you can please freeze the images and draw on the screen, uh, they'll be able to understand better. I'm not sure if you can do that. I don't think I, I can't I can't draw because this is uh, another software that I'm using, but probably I will freeze. Definitely I'll freeze and show you. Uh, okay. Let me optimize. Okay, can you see my uh, uh, the cursor? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so uh, uh, this is this is a locule. Okay, it is a single locule. Locule is any fluid. Any fluid containing space is a locule. The fl locule, uh, the fluid can be uh, serous, can be pus, can be mucin, can be blood. It's all termed in terms. I mean, it's all liquid in terms of fluid, and therefore a locule. And this is a single locule. Now, within the locule, I have to see what is the appearance internally. What I would, you know, in ultrasound means, what is the internal echogenicity? Now, when I use the term echogenicity, 
Ecogenicity simply implies the ability of any structure to throw back echoes. Now, again, what are echoes? You know, ultrasound is all about sound. So sound goes into the body like a pulse. It hits an object and what comes back is an echo. So the ability of a structure to throw back echoes is called echogenicity. So when I'm talking about in assist, I'm looking at the internal echogenicity. And this is described as, as a ground glass appearance. So a ground glass appearance with these white spots. Can you see these white spots? These are actually hemosiderin deposits. This, these three features, I mean, as I said, you can have even more locules, but the uh, uh, feature, diagnostic features are a ground, ground glass appearance, hyperacric foci, and also another very, very important, in fact, useful for a lot of masses is fluid allows all the sound waves to go through. So everything, all the sound waves hitting here or the pulses hitting here are going behind. And then this is tissue. So it's hitting the tissue and returning. So which means the ability of this area to throw back echoes is much higher because fluid will not throw back. Fluid doesn't bounce back. It, the echoes go through. So this is what we call posterior enhancement. So when you see posterior enhancement, you can be very sure that however solid appearing the, you know, the lesion looks, because there's posterior enhancement, there is definitely fluid. Now this fluid, because it's ground glass, it goes in favor of endometriotic cyst. So I hope that's clear. Now when I'll show you a hemorrhagic cyst, and as I was saying earlier, initially it is hyperechoic. Then as the clot resolves, there are fibrin strands that form, which give it a reticulate or a cobweb appearance, and then the clot retracts. So here you can actually see a retracting clot plus this is what we call a network. You know how a net, net is or a cobweb appearance. So this goes in favor of a, and a hemorrhagic cyst. So even if I didn't tell you that these are the features, if I just showed you, uh, you, you say, yes, this does not look endometriotic. So this is a hemorrhagic cyst. This also has posterior enhancement because blood or clot will allow all the sound waves to go through and hit the structure behind or rather hit the tissues behind. So this is a hemorrhagic cyst against what we just saw an endometriotic cyst. Any questions? Okay, uh, thank you for that uh, uh, request to demo hemorrhagic endometriotic. Any other, I'll show you the list. So feel free to choose whatever you want from here. Okay, uh, let me pose a question to you and I hope I request all of you to answer. When you get a report or when you hear somebody say, the, it's an angular pregnancy. What are the thoughts that go in your mind? Is it a normal pregnancy or is it, is it an abnormal pregnancy? When I say abnormal pregnancy, is it to be considered an ectopic pregnancy or is it to be considered a normal intrauterine pregnancy? So I'll just give you about, let's say about a few seconds and I hope to see some answers in the chat. Chat or Q&A, where do they uh, uh, In the chat, ma'am. How to identify? Endometriotic, I'll come to that. Uh, endometri okay, a topic you want, fine. E eccentric try you try. So Akshi Gupta, you, you, you are, is this, I am presuming that your answer is angular is eccentric intrauterine, absolutely correct. So let me show you the angular pregnancy and then I'll go to the ectopic because there has been a request for, uh, for an ectopic. So angular pregnancy, as one of you mentioned, is an eccentric intrauterine pregnancy. But the importance is, now watch, watch this week. Now you know that this is the sagittal plane of the uterus. Why? Because the and cervix is in continuity with the endometrium. Now I am just doing a sagittal sweep, okay? If I did not do the sweep and I just stayed here, then I will say no sac seen. Probably I look at the adnex and no sac seen and I will say pregnancy or unknown location. But because I did the sweep, I can see something here, but this is not so clear in the sagittal plane. So what do I do? I make my probe transverse, and then as I'm sweeping, can you see right on top, right on top, I can see this uh, sac. Now, how do I know it's a sac? Let me just do some image optimization. So, okay, I'll freeze this. Now, a, intra, a, a sac, a gestational sac, has, is a cystic space, which is a chorionic cavity and with a bright or a hyper periphery, which is the trophoblast. Now, we call this angular because it is right up in the lateral aspects of the uterine cavity, and that's why Dr. Akshi said eccentric, yes. 
but our ultrasound, the feature to, you know, definitely say it's angular is, I see the endometrium all around this. So can you see the endometrium going all around? So when the endometrium goes all around a gestational sac, whether it is upper or sometimes, you, you know, it may, it may be mid-cavity and then you don't know whether it's partially intramural or it may be close to the previous cesarean section scar and then you don't know if it's a scar ectopic. So in all these instances, see if the endometrium is covering the sac completely. If it is covering the sac completely, then we know that it is an intrauterine and not an ectopic. So uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I thank you for uh, answering this question. Now I'll go to, there was a request to show an ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy, again, if you go by pathophysiology, initially when the conceptus comes into the tube, it burrows into the muscularis, and all that we see is blood because the blood vessels are, you know, uh, getting, what do you say, disrupted. So we see a hematoma. Then beyond the stage of hematoma, that is called the blob sign. I have not brought a volume of the blob here, but in case you all want, I can go to my high, uh, you know, uh, pen drive and get it for you. But once it goes beyond the stage of a hematoma, then we see the conceptus in what is called the bagel sign. Now, I, I kind of very jokingly say that in India, we really, I mean, I, I've never bought a bagel. I know it's being sold in all these fancy stores. But it's more like, you know, what I would say, the medu vada or the udin vada or even a donut. So this, the, this is a stage in which it is most recognizable. So this is the ovary. I'm sure you all can recognize this because this is a well-circumscribed oval structure showing your anechoic spaces, which are the follicles. This is stroma, and this is actually the corpus luteum. Now, when I'm sweeping, can you see? Okay, let me just uh, magnify this image for you. Yeah, I've magnified it. Yeah. Can you see even, you know, uh, uh, when we do real time, we do something called a split sign, wherein I'm applying gentle probe pressure, and by that I can make this move away from the ovary. But on this demo, I can't really do the split sign. But even without the probe pressure, you can see there's, uh, you know, definitely a plane of demarcation between this structure and this structure. So this is what is called the bagel sign, and this is the tubal ring. This consists of the chorionic cavity surrounding by the trophoblast. So this is how an ectopic uh, will appear. Now, in order not to miss an ectopic, it's very important that we do the sweep. Now, for example, if, uh, if I, I mean, this is the left ovary. Why do I say the left ovary is? The ovary always lies medial to the uh, internal iliac. So this is the internal iliac, this is the left, and this is the ovary. Say, for example, I just identified, I, I, I just came here. I saw the ovary and I did not do a sweep. I will not pick up the ectopic. That's why scanning is real time. When I say real time, there's a lot of information you, you get because you do the sweep. And also that's the reason why still images sometimes do not give us a true picture. Unlike x-rays and uh, CT and MRI where you get whatever your films and then you read the films, scanning is all real time. So because it's real time, only when I do the sweep. Now, if I'm going this way, I can't see, I can't see any tubal ring or bagel, but when I go on the other side, this is the tubal ring or bagel. Another feature of this is when I put on color, this will take a peripheral vascularity, but for that matter, the corpus luteum also will take peripheral vascularity. Let me just freeze this and probably explain a little more. Yeah. Okay, so this is the ovary and this is the tubal ring. Now, if I put on color, both will take peripheral vascularity. Both have what is called a ring of fire appearance. Then how do I differentiate? Because this, again, is a constant dilemma among a lot of us. The corpus luteum is hypoequic. You know, when, this, when you compare it to the stroma, this is the ovarian stroma, this looks a little duller. Now, to put it in, in layman's terms, this looks a little duller. So this is called hypo. Hypo means less echoes. On the other hand, trophoblast is always hyperequate. So this, can you see, is much hyperequate than this. So the way to differentiate a corpus luteum and an ectopic is corpus luteum is hypoequic, whereas the periphery of a tubal ring is always hyperequic. So any questions on this? I mean, while I have this here. How to identify, I'll come to the endometriotic nodules. Mullerian anomalies is quite a lot. Uh, I don't have, a, okay, I'll show you one from the 
Molecular anomalies or is is a is a definite for the definite diagnosis. You will actually need three D, but you can have sensitizing features on two D. And I will uh, take you through one volume of this. Now again, I wish I could ask you. I mean, if you were doing on site or uh, a longer time. Now this is a uterus, so all of you are familiar now with this. Now I'm going to sweep. So this sagittal plane, cervix in continuity with the endometrium, I'm sweeping, okay? It looks pretty normal. It's only in the transverse plane. Now I'm making my probe transverse. Again, there are rules as to what, what how I'll make my probe transverse. And then what do I see? Let me just magnify this. Yeah. So down, this is the cervix. I'm coming into the endometrium, going up, up up, up, up. And then what do I see? That at some stage, the endometrium is splitting. So this is what is called the cat eye sign. See here, the endometrium is continuous like a normal uterus. Here again, if, it, if I did not do the sweep, if I did not go till the fundus, I will miss this because this looks very normal. It's only because I'm doing a sweep further up. I see the endometrium being split and this is called a cat eye sign. You know, cat eye. So when I see the cat eye sign, I know that the endometrium is split. So now I have to think of a uterine anomaly and what kind of uterine anomaly could it be? This is the clue. This is a fundal serosa. If the fundal serosa is smooth or, uh, or I would say convex when you look at from the fundus, if it's not indented, indented means like a heart shaped, then the differentials for this cat eye appearance would be an arcuate uterus or a septate uterus. And for that to differentiate between the two, I'll need to do 3D and take measurements. On the other hand, if the fundal serosa had dipped, this white line is a fundal serosa. If this had dipped, you know, it, it, it kind of forms a, like, like, a, like a heart shape. It goes like this. Then my differentials would be a septate uterus and a bicornate uterus. So I think on, uh, you know, whoever asked me, on neutral anomalies, there's a lot. I mean, Mullerian anomalies, this will take an hour, Dr. Prashant. Hope to see you at the residency program and then we can really thrash out everything. Ovarian tumors also will take a lot, but how to identify endometriotic nodules on TVS? Okay, uh, give me, uh, I'll, I'll show you a volume. Do we have time, Dr. Yogesh? Uh, yes, ma'am, we have time. With the okay, part please. Please feel free to stop me or pause me. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so this is the volume of an endometriotic cyst. I just showed you earlier. I will play, there are two volumes here. Okay, so what do we see? Again, unilocular, ground glass, but again, I see something hyperechoic. As I'm doing this sweep, hyperechoic. This is fresh bleed. I told you when hemorrhage just occurs, it'll be hyperechoic. So this is an endometriotic cyst with an area of fresh bleed. And these flimsy uh, echoes here is actually due to adhesions. So this is an endometriotic cyst. I'm sure all of you are convinced. Now let me take you, uh, you know, to another volume of the same patient. Okay, this is a cervix. Now, uh, this is just a focused volume, so which means it has only picked up the cervix and whatever is lying behind. It's not picked up the rest of the uterus. So what do I see? I see the cervix here and behind the cervix, now this is the anal canal. In all our scans, in gynae scan TVS, it, our scans don't start from looking at the cervix. Your scan should actually start from looking at the vagina, the vaginal area, and just above the introitus, you get the anal, uh, anal canal, and above that, that goes on to the rectum. So this is the anal canal and rectum, and I see a, what I call a hypoequic band-like structure here, which is the muscularis layer of the anal canal or rectum. Now, this hypoequic area is actually leading to a well-defined area here, which is the endometriotic deposit. This, in fact, belongs to the same patient in whom I showed you the endometriotic uh, cyst earlier. Now, you might ask me, why is it not the pouch of Douglas? Because pouch of Douglas is, again, the area behind the posterior uterus and the upper cervix and the rectum. So if this was the pouch of Douglas, then this hypoequate muscularis layer should have been continuous. Like, you can see it like a thin band. This band should have had the same appearance throughout. 
But you see that this band is opening into an area and this is what we call a deep endometriosis or an endometriotic nodule. So to answer in one line, you have to trace the hypomuscularis layer of the anal canal and rectum in order to identify endometriotic nodules. Septate, yes, that was a septate. How can you tell that it's a left internal iliac and left ovary? Okay, let me go back to that. Uh, which was it? It was an ectopic. Let me go back to that particular. Okay, we, we identified this as the ovary because well circumscribed, showing follicles and stroma and a corpus luteum. Now, internal iliac, any vessel is straight. Like, you know, it's, it's a defined straight appearance. If you imagine anatomy, the internal iliacs run, say from lateral to medial, they, they converge, like they go like this. So that's why I'm saying this is the internal, uh, left internal iliac. I'm not even going by the screen marker because there are no rules to keep the screen marker when a transvaginal scan goes. Somebody can have the screen mark on the right or somebody can have it on the left. The other way to notice is because the screen, this internal iliac is on the other side of the screen marker, it is a left, but I would go more by the direction of the vessel. Now, anything, any ovary medial to it, this has to be the left ovary. So, uh, is that clear? If not, please put your query again. I mean, if you're not understood, I'd be happy to explain. Dr. Forum, I think you had asked the question. I mean, imagine anatomy. This is the internal iliac. And okay, a simpler way is if, if it is a right, this has to be on the side of screen marker. But in order to get our right and left correct, in order to get our anterior and posterior, because I'm sure you'll agree with me quite a few times, if not a lot of times, we've heard that, oh, you reported right ovarian cyst, but when I opened it, it was a left ovarian cyst. Or you reported an anterior wall fibroid. When I opened it, it was a posterior wall fibroid. This, uh, this, you know, marking of anteroposterior right and left is very, very important. And for that, we pay attention to how we introduce the probe or how we place the probe transabdominally and where our screen marker is. I think we'll cover that. Uh, whoever's watched the basic lecture will have an idea on, on, on what I'm talking about. Uh, because, okay, you want to know, uh, Dr. Sion, actually on ultrasound, we don't diagnose because. On ultrasound, we diagnose PCOM, polycystic ovarian morphology. So let me take you through a polycystic ovary here. Now, I, I mean, I'm sure you know the definition of a polycystic ovary. The definition now is as per ashray, wherein any, oh, it's, it's per ovary. So follicle number per ovary, follicle number per ovary of equal or more than 20 follicles measuring two to nine millimeter, without uh, or ovarian volume equal or more than 10 cc in the absence of a dominant developing follicle and ovarian mass or a corpus luteum. Now, even while, you know, uh, just eyeballing, we know there are more than 20 follicles, but let me show you how we count the follicles. Again, when we count the follicles, we select what is called the best plane of the ovary, meaning whichever plane subjectively, now, as I said, when you do scan wherever in the body, you always have to get two planes. So I actually have to get three planes, sagittal, axial, and coronal. But in the pelvis, we only, uh, you know, we are happy with sagittal and axial because coronal and uterus can only be got on 3D. So in the ovary, now my uh, probe is uh, longitudinal. You can't see my probe. I'm doing a sweep and this looks quite good. I mean, this looks a big plane. I'm rotating my probe and again doing a sweep. Oh yeah, this actually is better. This is better. So this is my best plane. So I will stay in my best plane. I'll magnify the image probably. I'll decrease the brightness, increase the contrast till the follicles really stare at me. And then I'm moving so that I lose the margin of the ovary. So it's a, a count of the follicles from one margin to the other. Now, as I'm coming in, of course, there are too many follicles, so we may not be so accurate in the count. But as I'm sweeping slowly, I will be counting the follicles. Now, here the rule is I should only sweep in one direction. I cannot change and, you know, I cannot rotate my probe and count the follicles because if I did, if I did a rotation again on this and counted, then I'll be counting the same follicle. So the rule is lose the margin of the ovary, come to the ovary, 
and then again lose the margin of the ovary. So polycystic ovaries will have a count of 20 or more follicles or an ovarian volume of 10 cc or more. So um, what about ovarian tumor? That's, ovarian tumors can take a whole day. Now, uh, I think we will save that for another webinar, uh, Dr. Akshay, if it's okay, because you know, I, I, in, in five minutes, I won't know where to start, where to finish. We have anyway covered two ovarian tumors, endometrioid cyst and hemorrhagic cyst. So the, you know, it's nice to go through that in a very methodical way as per IOTA, that is international ovarian tumor analysis. So I think I'll skip that. Is there any other thing that was asked, which uh, you want me to demo? Mm. I think so far that is it, ma'am. Okay. Yes, uh, participants, do you have any questions? At least in the chat box, I think all the questions have been answered. Yes, oh, yes. Oh, it's close to nine, I think, yeah. No yes. wonder questions have stopped. I didn't realize the time I've enjoyed doing this demo. If there's any questions, I'm happy to stay back or you can pass it through Maru and I can answer it as well. Uh, so I've dropped in an email ID in the chat box, uh, which is a Maru support ID. Uh, if you have any questions or any concerns, you can write to us and we'll pass it on to ma'am and have an answer to you. Also, as ma'am was saying, she's our faculty for the Obscani Imaging on our uh, Obscani course. So all of these we, uh, topics which were covered by ma'am here is covered in depth on the app. So please do check it out. And uh, we will also have these sessions regularly in the coming months and we can connect again. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, for this. thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vai I mean, Dr. Yogesh and Vaishnav for the great support. And thank you, delegates, being here Saturday for one whole hour. I didn't realize an hour has passed. Thank you very much and hope to interact more with you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.